This episode on the podcast, I'm honored to have the former world number one, Denara Safina. She has won a total of 12 career titles and has been a three-time Grand Slam finalist. She is also the younger sister of former world number one ATP player, Marat Safin. They are the only brother-sister in tennis history who have achieved both number one rankings. Denara, thanks so much for joining yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess the first question, um, our listeners want to know is, you retired in 2014. What have you yeah. been doing to keep yourself busy? Well, um, my, uh, well, actually, the last match I played it was in 2011 in Madrid. And then I took a three years break and uh, um, I wanted to see if I would still be eager to come back and to see how I would feel. Uh, and uh, actually, it was not, I didn't have any desire to come back and my back was still was still not the best and I said like okay after three years if uh, I don't have that those emotions you know to come back so I better stop and uh, actually uh, it's everything around tennis always been around tennis uh, I worked a little bit in the Russian Federation in tennis I wasn't involved in um I wasn't involved in uh, in like coaching. It was more organ organization, and then uh, late last like uh, one and a half year, I'm more like helping some people, some part time people. Do you still play often? Um, only, only, only if I need like to play like exhibition or unless I'm playing uh, coaching someone and then I'll play but for myself I don't really like to play <laughs> <laughs> I mean I want to go back to your your childhood I understand both of your parents mm -hmm. were tennis coaches and obviously your older brother was very good do you think mm -hmm. that put more pressure on you to succeed in tennis um from one part yes and from the second part it was my biggest motivation I mean, having my brother playing and uh, having his, uh, him on top of the world, I would say, and he was number one and winning the Grand Slams, it's, it was something that was always inspiring me, always giving me the, that motivation, you know, to, uh, to join him, you know, to, to play the same tournaments and uh, to travel in the same, you know, to travel and all these things. So I think it was more motivation than, uh, than I would say uh, the, um, the, not the tension, but the pressure. The pressure. I, um, you. Were, I understand you moved to Valencia, Spain, when you were eight years old, right? No, when I was twelve. Twelve, twelve years old. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um. Did, do you think that was tough for you because you're moving to a different country and you have to learn a different language and a culture? Honestly, I don't have. Um, I don't have any problem living in other countries. Still now, like I don't. I like to travel. I like to discover, and uh, I think um, whenever I go. Or oh, wherever I go, I feel good. I, honestly, I, I'm, I don't have the, the thing that I, I want to stay in this place and uh, live forever. I like always to, to be around. So you didn't find you know, learning Spanish difficult when you were 12 years old? No. 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 <laughs> Very easy. I mean, obviously, um, you played professional tennis from when you were 15 till you were 25. Mm -hmm. What do you yeah. miss in that time frame of your life? I wouldn't say that I missed something. Uh, I really enjoyed every every moment of um, of it, every pra every practice, every tournament, every match. So, and I don't miss the childhood and all this. I think I had um, the best life I could ever imagine, and uh, I wouldn't change even if I would have I would have chance to to go back and say like oh, if I would like if I would go again playing tennis or having different life. I would say definitely same same life. Do you wish maybe you could have played for longer? Obviously, because you retired yeah. at twenty five. Yeah, this definitely yes. I, this but this uh, already is its experience. I wouldn't do the same mistakes I've done. I would take much more care of my body. I wouldn't be so stubborn, or I wouldn't put so much pressure on myself. But this is everything is experience. But yeah. from the other hand, I would I would never change for different life. I mean, if you could pick one moment of your career to relive that one single moment, what would it be? Um, I would say, like I always say, I think it's the whole 2008. But I think that the tournament that really changed my career, it was in Berlin. And this tournament, I always have it in my heart. And I really uh, like that tournament. I like the, um, the club where it's been playing. I, I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't play this year the, the grass court tournament. But that club is amazing. And um, so I would say Berlin, the tournament in Berlin changed completely my tennis career before and after. Um, you, read, you said something in the article that I think was really, really interesting. So you said, 
When I was number one in the world, everyone was gathering around me, wanting to just get a piece of me. Now it seems like many don't really care. So my question is, when you were playing on tour, do you think it was hard for you to make, let's say, real, genuine friends? Because so many of these people sort of wanted to be your friend, just because you were number one in the world at the time. Well, uh, uh, considering me, I'm a very close person. I don't have m many people around me still now. I have only a few people that are always next to me. And and the, the close people are always next to me. And uh, new people that are coming, they're coming and going. Someone is staying. Not, not really that I had that huge difference, you know, like uh, from being number one, that I had a completely different, you know, different bunch of people around me. I always had a small group of people. Do you think it was hard to tell the difference between someone who, let's say, genuinely wanted to be your friend or someone who sort of wants to be your friend because of status? Was it hard to tell the difference between those people? Uh, I never let people close to me. You know, that's why for me it was difficult. I always kept the people who, are, who was already next to me and I didn't really like to, to get new people around me. So that's so, like, that's still even today? Yes. Even today. Okay. Um, my next question is, do you think it was maybe, you know, hard to be yourself, do you think? Because of the media attention, all that stuff? I don't know. I didn't have the, that problem. I didn't like, I was how I was, you know, I never uh, really tried to be a different person on the camera or... Uh, or trying to be someone else. I always be. I always been myself. Not not really. I would say. Okay. Um. So my next question is obviously, you talk about everyone. You know, when you're number one, everyone trying to get a bit more of you. Do you think that's a price you have to pay to be any top athlete in any sport? Well, that's from the other hand. Like now, um, t taking the time back. From the other hand, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for the attention. You're looking to be famous. You're looking, you know, to be more recognized by the media. You want to be. So, from the other hand, that's something that you are willing, you know, to be. Uh, so it's uh, uh, just some people are not prepared. That's what I would say. From one hand, you you really eager and you really want this to have it to happen, but once it's happened, you get scared because you didn't expect that it's going to be like this. And I think this uh, um, player should learn step by step that's saying like okay the, the higher you go in the ranking you will have more attention it's part of your job and it's normal that you will have more um, more attention looking back do you prefer this way of life this more quieter way of life where you know you're retired no one's really you know taking much attention to you or do you prefer you know where there's a lot of media attention on you which one do you prefer the way of life a little bit of everything I, w I always like to have my time and from the other hand I always like to have some attention from the media. I think this is normal. This is what we used to do and um, used to have and uh, I, I always enjoy to have uh, some attention. Obviously you were world number one. Um, other players like you know Naomi Osaka and Angelique mm -hmm. Kerber, they struggled to deal with the pressure of being world number one. How did you deal with the pressure when you were on top? Well, I think not only them, most of the people, they struggle. And it's something, I think it's, it is normal to struggle, you know, because uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, uh, how you say, how you would explain this? It's difficult to practice, you know, you will be number one and you will have that attention. So, I mean, how you can practice that, um, that feeling. But uh, I think uh, it just, you have to change your perspective of viewing it and saying like, okay, this is just part of my job. And uh, it doesn't mean that I have to be now the best. I'm number one. I'm, I'm the best player, but it's normal to have ups and downs. I'm not a robot, you know, and um, just not taking it too personal, you know, and saying that it's not end of the world if you lose the match. It's just part of your job. It's one of your day. And, uh, yeah, and um, just, I think like the same mistake I did, I was taking it too personal. And I was, whenever I would lose a match, I would be very down, very upset. And uh, I always thought like, oh, I lost the match and I'm not number one, I'm not good. And uh, 
just learning from that, that's fine. You're still number one, nothing happened. I mean, God of One played good and it's also a person. And being number one, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to lose, to lose the match. Um, I think one thing you would agree, you know, in your career was someone, you wish somebody would teach you how to manage your emotions better. What would the Denara of today tell that 22, 23 year old Denara who was playing those Grand Slam finals? What would you tell her? I always say to enjoy more, uh, to be more in the present. You know, sometimes I was, whenever I would step on the court and, um, and, uh, I would step on the court and I would already think, will I win the match or will I lose? And I was never playing that match, you know. And uh, I wanted, I would like to say to that girl, say, you know what, go there, be every point on the court with your 100% concentration and enjoy the moment. Doesn't, don't think about winning or losing because that, um, that experience, it can happen, it can be once, twice or three times or like Roger many times, but you never, you never know how many times. So in, take as much as positive energy as you can from that moment. Do you remember how you felt, let's say, before your third Grand Slam final in Roland Garros 2009 compared to your, oh. first, gra compared to your first Grand Slam final in 2008? Yeah. Were you, was it similar? No, I was completely... I was so nervous before my um, final against Sveta. I was completely, I wasn't, I wasn't there. Like I was too tense. I wanted to win so badly and I couldn't handle my emotions. And uh, against Anna, I was nervous, but uh, it was different nervous. Like I was already, okay, it's my first final and I'm happy the way that I came to the final. I, uh, it, it was completely two different matches, I would say. And against Sveta, I was too tense. And Sveta played really good tennis, so she didn't let me go into the match and, uh, you know, helping me to, to get into the match. What about your, um, your second final against Serena? What would, you, would you say you were really nervous for that one as well? Even though you were in the final in 2008 in Roland Garros, do you think that gave you more experience? To handle um, your emotions? Well, against, well, against Serena, it's, um, I think at that time, playing against Serena, it was something... You can only you could only pray that she has a terrible day. It was something that you, I would say for myself, I knew that stepping on the court that she's better player than me, and uh, I didn't had my chances to to beat her, especially in the final. It could be like if it would be clay court, it would be different. But on hard court, playing the final against her, it's uh, you don't have many chances, you know. I mean, we're talking about handling emotions. Obviously, um, Marat, Marat, your brother. Did he ever, um, you know, coach you how to handle your emotions better, maybe? Um, not really that I've been asking him, because uh, um, I always say that men and women were completely different. You know, we cannot compare. And uh, the way men approach the match, it's completely different the way women approach the match, you know. So uh, I wouldn't say that uh, women should listen to the men and men should listen to the women. Because it's, it's completely two different emotions, two different persons and two, two, two different type of people, you know. So if, I think it's closer if women would speak with a woman and men with a man. So would, we're talking about the Grand Slam finals um, just now. Do you think um, going inside your third Grand Slam final actually gave you more doubt instead of confidence? What do you mean? So you said in your third Grand Slam final, you were really, really nervous. Yeah. Would you, yeah. So would you... So you, why, would you, why would you say you weren't confident? Because you were saying, you could say to yourself, look, this is my third Grand Slam final. I've got so much experience now. You know, let's do I'm this. So no, because I was so afraid to lose the match. And at the end, I lost the match. Okay. I mean, I think many young players, you know, would dream of having a career like yours. You, you achieved mm -hmm. number one ranking. You know, sure, you never ended up, you know, winning a Grand Slam final. Maybe it was destiny. But are you satisfied with your career? Or perhaps you think you could have done more? The only thing I could have done more is maybe to play longer, but um, definitely not. Uh, I'm I'm satisfied. So uh, was it? A, it was a back injury, I understand, right? That um, yeah. made you yeah L five S one yeah uh, stress fracture. Do you know when the, when that actually happened? At which tournament? Which year? It started slowly. Um, I started to have problems in uh, two thousand nine. Um, Starting at the Wimbledon, I think, or French Open already. Slowly there, I started to have some 
tension in my bag and I was like, oh, what's that? Something, to... and then slowly it was getting worse and worse. And then at the US Open before, actually in, I think, I, I don't remember if I played Toronto or it was um, Montreal. It was really bad. Cincinnati was horrible. The whole US Open series was horrible. Yeah. And, and then it's in the US Open after US Open was disaster. When you made the um, the decision to retire, was it were you sad or were you you know were you content with yourself that this is done, this is it? No, I wasn't sad. Uh, I was. I've done what I've done. I've done the best I could, and uh, actually, I was satisfied. With all this um, experience you've had, do you ever see yourself coaching on tour one day with a professional yeah. player? Yeah, I would like to. Yeah, it's something that I'm really interested, in and I would like to try and. I would like to share my experience. Would you say you'll be coaching a man or a woman when you're coaching? No, a woman. Man, no. <laughs> um, last week I interviewed um, former world number one, Juan Carlos Ferrer, who your brother played against many times. He said that um, the younger generation today are not focused on tennis enough. They spend too much time on social media, on their phones, worried about, um, you know, how many likes they have on social media. What do you think? I think it's, he has a part of it, which is true, but that's um, life, which is now. And I think it's getting worse. And uh, the young kids, they're already on the phone and they're much more in the phone. I think it's good to have it in balance. And uh, it's also, I think, work of the uh, job of the coach to say, like, listen, Let's have it. Let's keep it in balance. And you have your time when you have your phone, and you can do whatever you want, and you can check how many likes you have. And when it's time of your, the, when it comes time to your practice, you have to be focused, two hundred percent. So uh, I think it's just uh, having everything in balance. Do you do you think maybe that's why in the men's game that the younger generation still hasn't really broken out? You know, winning a Grand Slam. Do you think maybe that's the reason why? Mm, and I actually have even not even I wasn't even thinking about it. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, <laughs> why do, why do you think maybe um in the Russian women's tennis it's in such a decline after maybe two very strong decades? Why do you think the next generation couldn't really follow in the footsteps like yourself, Sharapova, Zvonareva, and why do you think that is? Many things can I don't know be. If, I mean, it's tough to say because uh, when I see the players, I, I see them very good, but something, uh, something they're missing to become better. And it's tough for me to say what exactly is missing. Um, maybe, maybe they're satisfied with their career. Maybe they don't want to be better. Maybe they have enough. They say, listen, I like to be number, I don't know, 50 in the world and I practice maybe one hour a day and I have a great life and to be number one in the world, I need to practice, let's say, eight hours a day and um, being very tense and nervous. So it just depends what player really wants. It's it's in their mind. So if they don't want to be higher in the rankings, it means that they don't want it. It's very simple. When somebody wants, he will go higher in the rank. How do you feel about the um, the next generation of young Russian men's players? So you've got Medvedev, Hachinov, and, and Rublev. How do you feel about them? Well, I'm really happy for them, and I think they're doing good. And, uh, I mean, it's sad that it's... Um, especially Andre had an unbelievable career at the beginning of the year, winning straight uh, two tournaments, and, I mean, finishing with uh, winning the tournament in the end of the year, uh, having uh, an amazing start of the year, and now he had to stop because of the um, the, the virus. But I hope that uh, when they come back, they're gonna keep uh, keep strong and um, having our next generation, same as Marat and uh, Kafelnikov. Who do you um? Who are you most impressed by on the men's game um right now, the Russian player? Well, I like Rublev because we're from the same club, so I would okay. say. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about you know, men's and the men's Russian in the Russian men's game. There's so many top players, but in the women's. They're not breaking out. So do you think maybe the Russian men, Russian tennis players, I'm oh, sorry, the Russian men tennis players, they're more ambitious than the women. Do you think maybe that's the reason why? I don't think so. It's just that it, it happened that right now they're doing well and, uh, and uh, you know, they, uh, their game is uh, clicking and uh, they're playing their best tennis. And maybe 
God knows, maybe in, in one year we'll have again five top, top players in the top ten in women. So it's just a matter of time and a matter of luck a little bit. I mean, when you were playing, you were playing with the Fed Cup um, and the Olympics. With, is it hard to become friends with so many players? Because, you know, you're playing them week in, week out. Do you think it's very hard to, be, to become very close friends? You don't have to be close friends with the people you play. I mean, it's, uh, it's everything, it's in the head. Why you have to be friends? It's some, they're your colleagues, you play with them, but you, they don't have to be your friends. I mean, if you go to the job, then not every, every person with who you work is your best friend. Okay. It's, it's exactly the same. I don't know why the people think that um, in tennis, if you're playing in the same tour, you have to be best friends. Are you best friends with all your colleagues that you work in the office? No. With someone, one, you go for lunch, with someone you don't go for lunch. Why? Because uh, that's how you feel, the same way in tennis. I mean, the last question I want to end on is um, if you could create your ultimate um, woman tennis player. So if you could choose one player's forehand, backhand, serve, volley, and mental strength, who would it be? So let's start with maybe forehand. Actually, I haven't, I don't, I haven't even watched so much for women tennis. It's tough to say for me. Maybe. I, um, who you were playing against back in those days, back in your day? Forehand, I would say Svetlana Kuznetsova had amazing forehand. Justine, Kim. I think Svet, Svetlana, I would say. What about backhand? Justine. Serve? Serena. <laughs> what about Vongi? Mm, Amelie Moresmo. Um, footwork. Justine. And Kim. Justine and Kim, yeah. And mental strength. Justine. Again, wow. So you think Justin Hennens was one of your, um, you know, many qualities of her was one of the best? Yeah, for me, yes, definitely. No, I mean, so Denara, thank you so much for taking your time to do this interview. So I just want to know if fans want to, you know, keep in touch with you social media you're active on twitter and instagram 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 so what's your username if, if, if um, fans want to um follow you dinara safina official official okay and yeah. before we end i used to um we do this with every guest so if you could say i'm dinara safina and you're listening to the double bagel um you could say that so okay hi i'm dinara safina and you're listening to double bagel Thank you so much, Dinara. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank okay. you. Stay Bye. safe. Stay care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.